is Dr. Liz Burton Crow, and I'm the Director of Education for the Carrillo Center for Nonviolence. Welcome back to Living One, our monthly webinar series where presenters from around the world share their vision of a future in which humans and other animals live as one community in peace and wellness. Given all this unfolded in the past year, these conversations are more important than ever. For they are more than mere conversations. They are opportunities for building community, salve for the isolating wounds of our time. Through Living One, together we attempt to answer the question, we know it's wrong, but what does right look like? This month, we welcome Linnea Rischke, a visual artist and writer who centers her practice on restoring the value of non-human animals as kindred beings worthy of her adoration and respect. She creates paintings, drawings, objects, and poetry that honor the enigmatic subjectivity of non-human animals and encourage the audience to practice empathetic imagination. With her MFA in visual art from Washington University in St. Louis, she's been exhibited nationally and published her first book, Kindling, with Lantern Publishing and Media in September 2021. Kindling is a collection of poetry, photography, and painting created from her experience working at a small family meat farm in the summer of 2019. Kindling situates art and poetry is able to touch the soft, empathetic core of each of us, which must surface in order to do the necessary work of regarding more than human creatures as kin, not kindling. She currently lives and works as an educator in St. Louis, Missouri. And interviewing uh, Linnea today is our very own Dr. Gabe Bradshaw. Welcome. Oh, well, hello everyone. It's wonderful to see you. And Linnea, thank you so much for being here. We're kind of gonna jump in um, with, um, before we are gonna look at some of your art, I hope. Um, tell us a little bit, Liz gave us a few pointers and a few little tidbits. Can you kind of tell us or describe your arc to, uh, which led to uh, Kindling? And, um, and I'll ask kind of a sub question. D do you feel a part of nature and have you always felt a part of nature? Uh, that's such a good question. I, I'm going to actually ask, answer your second question first, because I feel like that's so, um, you know, I, I, I'm assuming most people who listen to this might know or probably know of Robin Wall Kimmer's book, Wait, Reading Sweetgrass, and how she has an anecdote about you know, asking her students, like, do you love nature? And everyone says yes. And it's like, does nature love you? And everyone kind of hesitates, you know, like, do, um, does the non-human world love me? You know, and, and that really asks the question of like, are we acting in the way or, you know, are our actions um, worthy of love. Um, so anyway, I, I think that's a question I, I struggle with, um, admittedly, especially in this contemporary world, but maybe I'll, 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 uh, pause that conversation first to just go back to your first question to say that, um, I, uh, have been interested in this or invested in this subject matter for, um, maybe a decade now. So I, I had kind of each, you know, person has a kind of pivotal experience, I think, with regarding the subject matter. And so I had one of those early on in, in or late in high school, um, late adolescence. And since then, really, um, like my, my art making and my um, real deep disturbance over the injustice that um, of particularly farmed animals. That was what first, um, kind of pulled at me. So, um, but my, my work has really been kind of an intermeshing of those two since then. Um, and so I, um, have sort of tried as, you know, each artist or each academic, I mean, art are your professional life has different chapters to it. So my early chapters were much more based on, I would say kind of an activist lens in which, um, you know, much more graphic imagery, I would say, you know, focused on kind of what we typically think of as um, what farmed animals endure, which is very important to have that of, um, you know, gestation crates and, um, you know, calves being separated from their mothers and et cetera. Um, so I, you know, read a lot, you know, read a lot of ethic, ethics and philosophy and, um, looked at a lot of imagery and, you know, watched all those documentaries that we're very accustomed to, but I kind of felt an absence, like there was still a, a separation between me and the subject matter. And so kindling the book 
um, that was not actually, I had no intention of it coming into, into the uh, shape of a book, but came from a place of wanting an embodied experience, something that made it closer to home, closer to my own, like the sensory aspect of it, um, more real to me. So that was sort of the, the, um, what brought me to wanting an experience, uh, being at a, a meat farm. So, um, so can you just say a little bit more about this yearning and you, you, you felt this compulsion to have um, a direct experience and embodiment? Uh, I, I think that's a really critical observation and, um, and it has significance in terms of um, making changes in our culture and, and also the evolution of our culture. Yeah, definitely. I, um, I would say my you know, this is all kind of unconscious at the time and reflecting more on it after the fact, you know, as my, as this book kind of leads into other projects, like I, I would say my, um, my focuses of my practice are, are attention, the, the quality of attention and sort of the embodied sensory engagement with non-humans. Um, and I think that, yeah, we're, you know, um, art making it, requires that I think I mean there are very in- intellectualized artworks and those are very important as well but I think that tapping into um, that intuitive responsive sensory body is so important not only with non-humans but like in our own you know personal uh, health <laughs> uh, you know uh, internal life as well so um, and, and also, I mean, that is the way in which we engage with non-humans is mostly in a, in a bodily, um, through body language and through um, that kind of connectivity. So the, the poems itself have this like sensory element. And then my artwork also has a tactility to it. So they're not just images. They're, they're much, they're, they come from this kind of like, um, acute attention to uh, what I was hearing and smelling and feeling at the time and kind of translating that and expressing that to the viewer, to the reader. So when you're talking um, about this internal participation, um, it's quote unquote, not only for yourself, but in a sense, it really resonates with uh, this idea of deprivileging um, this sort of assumed human uh, participation at a distance, (laughs) you know, Uh, and, and in a sense, it is a kind of, uh, if done in the, in the, um, I wouldn't say proper, but I would say in in an aligned way, uh, it is a much more ethical and egalitarian way of interacting, not only with non-humans, but each other. Yeah. Um, There's a kind of a veracitude which comes through, which our language and technology, um, can do, but also deftly obfuscates. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think um, that also it's asking us to be porous and receptive to what comes to us. So part of, um, you know, my, my experience, so the, 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 the sort of way in which I entered the experience of going to the farm was to be as vulnerable and as open to what I, what happened as possible. So um you know, that included my lens was like, what are the ways in which, what are the kinds of human animal relationships that happen in this, um, in this environment? And part of that, which maybe we can talk about now or, or later, um, is the way in which I became implicated in the, um, in the environment and, and my, my own actions, um, kind of surprised me in the way in which, Um, you know, I couldn't, I'm someone who, you know, I I have an ethic of how I, my, the practice of my, myself when I'm in the world, especially with non-humans of being, you know, as gentle and soft, as soft footed as possible. And so when I was in the, at the farm, I couldn't be as kind as I wanted to be, you know, and, and, and that led to being more aggressive than I normally would be. And that was part of what was so surprising was just how, um, you know, the 
the structure, which here, of course, this is a fact, this isn't a factory farm. It was a small family farm. So not nearly the level of extreme that goes on in those industrial um, environments, but it was still enough to be, um, to make me implicated in. So that was, that's part of the book that I, I'm hoping is um, kind of surprising, but also a way for people who aren't, who see this as being kind of, because um, I think we can have this old holier than thou issue that I think I tried to be as honest about the whole experience as possible. Um, can you give us an example of, of, of the yeah. sort of process that you're describing? Yeah, I wonder, maybe I, I might, I have the book with me. I might read a poem. Would that oh, be? wonderful. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, so just if you could sh show the audience the, the cover and. and the yeah. Book. Yeah. Okay, great. I will. I'm just going to pull up the poem. Um, so, yeah, this is the, the cover of the poem and the, the book itself has poetry that are it's coupled with photography. That's sort of the first, the book is set up to be in three parts, um, but that's the first part. Um, so I have a series of poems called Foreign Matter, um, partly in the way in which while I was there, I had this in severe allergic reaction. And I, that term foreign matter, just, you know, your, your immune system, like, uh, became kind of uh, metaphorical for me. So I'll just read one poem that sort of refers to what I was just saying about um, the discomfort of my actions. Um, so one, turned around, saw I failed to secure the latch, four young ducks leapt out, my heart pulsed to the rapid beating of their wings, my hands reached far from my body to enclose them in a grip lighter than a chokehold, harder than a caress. My palms singed as with an abscess swelling, white blood cells struggling to remember tenderness. I'll read one more actually. So there's, um, this is the third of that poem. Um, a stinging at the peak of my scalp, a quail jumped out as I smacked my head on the door's edge. I spit curses into the air, then sat on the ground, sweetened my sound to coax her out from underneath the cage. She tiptoed closer and right when she finally emerged assuaged, the claws of my hands lunged. So there are several poems of that Thank you. tenor, um, which are hard for me to read even now, just how, um, yeah, how hard it was to, um, to be kind to them because of, it was like the stress that they felt, um, which was very clear. I mean, this is, again, a small family farm, but they were still encaged, um, you know, still confined, still you know, a density of bodies that was not meant to be that, that in that environment. Um, so they were very stressed whenever I would interact with them. And that led to me feeling stressed. And then those interactions couldn't be what they would be in a sanctuary environment or, you know, in your home when um, they're companion animals. So, um, yeah. And then to a certain extent, um, the, you were under the jurisdiction of right. the farm Exactly. Yeah. Protocol it, and things. Right. Right. So I couldn't let them escape. That was part of it. You know, it's like, um, so I had to push them back in if they were trying to uh, run out or, um, yeah. And I, I, you came to work at that farm, obviously, on purpose. Right. Um, was it on purpose in terms of, uh, like you said, to, to really immerse yourself and to engage? rather than standing aloof or? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, I, I took on that posture, but I do think it's something that we all could be more open with in terms of taking on what's most uncomfortable and not to assume it as identity, but as to assume, like in the anthropological sense or in the, you know, participant observer 
sense of, to be both in and out, to be participating enough to understand in a, in a more intimate way, but then being able to come back and be like, what, you know, what just happened, you know, to be, have that kind of critical um, point of view. So um, I didn't have any, I, I, yeah, I kind of came in trying to be as open as possible, but um, didn't have any sort of preconception of what would happen or what, um, what would come out of it. Um, but I think our ability to hold discomfort, you know, especially in these circles can be kind of, because the, I mean, of course the truth is, um, a lot of people are, don't, you know, don't have this value system. And so to be able to understand or try to conceptualize what is still going on, why, you know, these systems are still the way they are is, important I think just even in the even in the context of bridging political divides these days you know like those those cross um, connections and conversations are important Do you have conversations um, with the other humans there while you were you know about some of these things yeah I well I kind of had the sense of being kind of undercover in the sense not wanting to um, completely say that I, you know, I'm actually a staunch vegan and like all of my work is, you know, um, against this sort of thing. So I, I sort of said my, my, how I approached it was like, I'm, I'm an American, you know, interested in the humane, you know, humane practices here. And, um, but the, the truth is, is they were very kind people and, I don't out them at all. Like, I don't even say where the farm was. Cause I don't, that's not the point for me. It was more of just like, you know, this could be anywhere, um, which, um, you know, the, the truth is the ideology that, um, sees animals as bodies to reap profit off of is, is almost ubiquitous. So, um, but I, it was interesting to, you know, I, I, I said some things to them, but I didn't quite want to give myself away. So I didn't really have those kinds of conversations. Um, well, you were staying, I mean, if you reflect back on what you were talking about in terms of your process, you were staying within that space of um, interbeing and, and experience. Yeah. Um, and, and in that sense, your art and your poetry uh, as well as your reflections now are, are really reflecting on those experiences as this, this interrelated experience um, without an objectification. So in other words, that, that's how I see it is that the particulars right. um, uh, only surfaced when they had significance relative to your experience. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And like the voice of the, of the, far, of the two, sort of um, husband and wife who ran the farm are kind of interwoven in the poem. So their voice kind of comes out in a way that hopefully is kind of clear how, what their ideology is, but I kind of, I used it as kind of its own um, kind of material to bring into the poems of their, what they, their sort of phrases that I heard from there, from talking mm -hmm. to them. You know, it's a, a I, I think there's kind of a growing sentiment. It's certainly been around for a long time, uh, but I, I feel like you're embodying it in, in a very special way where we're looking for a new, a different language um, because we are explicitly trying to, at least uh, there's a sort of an effort to deconstruct these barriers between us and quote unquote non-humans, as well as with between humans as such right and so in a sense uh it's coming into what you're describing is really coming into relationship with words in a very different kind of a way not only are you doing that but also um encouraging for yourself um, I, I think probably for others in the sense of exploring other media yeah um that we can relate to so in that example that you were talking about like not outing them in other words not labeling and not putting words on um and again it's even the art media as well as words which you can look at as art media the poetry etc or just even prose 
conversation. Uh, it's kind of, I think what you're talking about is also um, disidentifying. Yeah. In other words, using them as more of like a stream of a stream for expression. Yeah. Um, rather than as any kind of barrier or any kind of um, delineation. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think that's kind of one thing that I um, think about as far as like an, an activist artist, like that kind of identity for my own self that um, I think each artist within this field has their own sort of orientation around that subject matter or that kind of label. And I definitely, I'm, I'm, I just tend to not like labels in general, but, um, but I do think to what you were saying, Gay, um, that, you know, I'm much more interested in my work being a little bit, having a little more breathing room in it, not being so A equals B, you know, not, I'm like less didactic, more ambiguous in the sense of um, just being a little more amorphous, that there's clear intent going on. There's something that's being felt, but that hope, you know, I'm hoping that it, it's asked the viewer to be, or the viewer, the reader to be more contemplative, like, you know, in reading the poems, you know, these, there are kind of these instances side by side of like, what is the through line? Like, I want, I'm curious for them to ask more questions rather than me, you know, hand feeding or, you know, giving them an answer to, of course, I have my own ethic, but I want people to arrive at that their, themselves through their own ways. Mm -hmm. Um, even in like, I've, I've thought of that in the sense, cause I also am, am a, I'm a teacher and I love to just ask my students a ton of questions, you know, like they'll, um, especially with regarding their work, you know, they'll say something and then I'll ask them, okay, well, well why is that, you know, and kind of this, it, our discussions end up being me more provoking them to think further by asking questions. And so in that sense, I hope my work, or I, I intend for my work to do something similar. Could you share uh, with us maybe one of your um, pieces of art um, to, to, to kind of illustrate what your yeah describing? let's see yeah let me um, it's one of my favorite <laughs> let's see yeah so. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I can just, I'll just share this one <laughs> to begin with, because they all kind of have their own stories. So I have, this is one of four, five actually that are in the first part of the book that are just these ash drawings. So they're basically, they can come off the paper really easily. So they're this sort of um, transient drawings in that way. But um, so this was a drawing that I made um, after a bird, um, died in my, in my hands. And so, um, you know, I think along the lines of what I was saying with, as far as like didactic versus ambiguous of like having, like me having a feeling about the drawing or having a feeling about an, an experience, translating that feeling into a drawing or a painting, and then sharing that with others as a way to kind of feel to what what that experience was like so um so this is one from that and i have sort of these series of four hens that are kind of um well this this might i don't know if thematically you thought to, <laughs> we you thought of talking about this gay but um i think a lot about empathy and too and mm -hmm. kind of a lot of the the works that i the drawings and paintings that i make um, the animals, the animal subjects are kind of, they're appearing, but they're disappearing at the same time. They're kind of, I like to think of it as like they're here and they're elsewhere. Um, so uh, this kind of like flickering and not quite like feeling their presence, but not quite able to see the full outline or they're not like, I rarely will make a drawing that's like fully, you know, hair feather by feather kind of are a, a super um, detailed drawing in that way. Like, you know, you often think of an image being captured. And so a lot of times in my, in my drawings, actually maybe I won't talk about that one yet. I don't try to capture them. It's kind of this like um, suggesting their presence. Mm -hmm. um, 
Well, the term capture is is an interesting word, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, if we if we can, well, I, I'm curious what you have else to say, because I have, there are a few other that I think might come up later. So I'll just okay. stop my share for now. Yeah, that sounds great. This is just a little bit of a, a dog leg, but you, when, when you were, your experience in art school, um, can you describe that? And, um, mm -hmm. What your experience was like there and, you know, how, I don't know how to call, call it, you know, what was the sort of the internal processes that were going on and, um, and in, in kind of your own relationship with art with a capital A kind of thing, you know? Yeah, no, that's a great, um, that's a great question. <laughs> there are very, I would say there are very few artists who are capital A artists working on this subject matter. So it's, feels it has been has has felt isolating especially in those contexts of academia and you know a gallery of um you know people are very defensive you know it's I, I've been making work um you know really I, my work has been if you look on my website it's like basically all about the experience of farmed animals for it's been that way for a, a very long time so um, for, throughout the arc of my time at, in my bachelor's, my master's, it was a lot of um, people asking me, it's like, so do you want me to be vegan now? You know, just kind of that, a, a little bit of a cutting, kind of assuming that it's, it's like that kind of straightforwardness. So because of that, those kinds of conversations that I had, that's, I think that's partly why my work has started to soften a little bit, not as um, not in a defeatist kind of way, but I've just found that that some of my works that were more straightforward were actually leading to people to be more defensive and not then being able to break that. So, um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, our, our, my time in school was difficult for me in terms of getting the response or, you know, generating that kind of conversation that I had been looking for. So mm -hmm. um, it's more outside of school that I've been able to find that more. It's a, it's a, I'm sure you've run across this, but it's a common theme that uh, individuals express, whether they're artists or doesn't matter, um, as quote unquote, activists for nature, activists for animals, the sense of isolation. Yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, I, I want you to, if you could just sort of reflect on that um, in the sense of the relationship between isolation, um, solitude and mm -hmm. community, and are they mm -hmm. separate? And is there, is there an existential quality or ontological quality, which is evolving um, as we, when I say we, you know, it's like we Kimosabi, who are we? But I yeah. mean, as as our species or this dominating culture is starting to reintegrate um, mm. into different dimensions, into the spiritual again, into uh, a different sets of relationship. Can mm. you maybe? I, I kind of get asked you a big question, but yeah, you know, people talk about we talk about community, and there is isolation, and there is solitude. But are they? really mutually exclusive and is this really reflective of uh, of an evolution into uh, a, a way of being hmm. which is uh all of those above in a, a quote-unquote positive way yeah i mean i think both both coming to terms with isolation and aloneness and you know, being comfortable in that space and knowing that you're integrated and interdependent on a community or so, I mean, I have, I hold that tension all the time, more of, more because of, well, in many ways, but mostly because I'm an intro, I'm introverted at heart. So um, my, yeah, I, I have difficulty navigating those two worlds, but, you know, it's just to, I've, I've um, initiated more recently trying because community especially in this not um covid related but just within um sort of animal advocacy um 
you know, I've tried different forms of it, of being like activist groups or um, different ways and nothing has really felt right. And so recently I started a, um, a small group virtually of artists and writers who are, whose work um, or whose practice is dedicated to the subject matter. So I, I'm finding, you know, just even in an ecological sense, like community, having that inter that knowing that um, there's the support system that you are contributing to and that, and that you are a part of is so, um, so necessary for survival in so many ways. So um, I think that's one thing that I understand in, in uh, my life, but less so in my professional life. Like that's been hard for me to cultivate a kind of community and feel connected. Um, I think especially I, I think the subject matter, you know, can be a real individual burden sometimes too, you know, it can be hard to go at it alone. And especially art, you know, art making is, is inherently an individual practice. You know, I, I, I need to be alone to make the work at the same time. Um, you know, we need each other to remind ourselves that, you know, it's, we're not each holding gr grieving alone. You know, it, it is this, um, shared, um, suffering that we're undergoing. So, um, I, I, I don't know. I, I struggle. I, I really do struggle with aloneness these days with, you know, just the continual, um, reminder of what, uh, non-humans are going through. And, uh, but, but I, yeah, I mean, that's why it's just so important to have these kinds of, uh, loci, <laughs> um, for people to come together and, um, so it's very, I mean, it just feels very important in this work to have community. So you spoke earlier and, and certainly in, in your book and in your work, you know, you talk about transformation, you know, self-transformation and evolution or however you want to want to call that. Um, and when that process is going on, which I certainly see in your art, you know, it really speaks to this really beautiful dynamic at very deep substrate in, in, in your psyche as such. <laughs> um, but you know, that in a sense, that's a kind of a shift in terms of one's own identity. You know, certainly when you were experiencing the, the, the farm and the individuals who were kept there, um, you were ch changing perhaps your sense of self and, and identity. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then, you know, I guess I'm sort of telling <laughs> than asking the second part is, uh, you know, in a sense, maybe this is a tension part of community because we're re- redefining what community means and what our needs are for feeling connection. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I definitely, I would say my, this, the, the process of making this book has really um, shifted my sense of what's like the priorities and the ethical w ways in which I make art. So, um, so I, Actually, I don't know if this would be something. Can I? I'm, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so I um, I made several works um, regarding or with sort of dealing with 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 death and grieving after coming back from the farm, and um, this work um, was titled or is titled remains. And it, so, you know, the average life of a factory or of a, you know, broiler industry term, uh, hen is, um, 47 days, according to a, like a 2018 statistic that I read. So, um, I, I did, a so this, this is why I'm talking about this work is because it's kind of a pivot point, but, um, so for 47 days, I drew this picture of a, of a hen, over and over again and sanded it down. So it was kind of just vaguely there, um, painted it uh, over again. So I was kind of um, repeating this again, this each day, this process of making this work and kind of the tick marks um, at the top were kind of notating each day. And I hadn't made a work like this before. It was very new for me. And I, the, the 
the at the um, sort of remnants from sanding the painting down each or the drawing down each time I collected and made um, I put into an urn or I made I made an urn and, and put the the remains in as a way to kind of gesture to the these like metaphorical ashes that came from the process of making the piece. Um, so this was kind of the first work that had this element of transformation. I know this isn't exactly what you said, Gay, but um, I actually just wanted to talk about this as a way to then gesture. So I've, I've been making, let's see, I, I've been making these stones recently. So in the book, I talk about how I've collected um, bones of, of chickens um, through various means from the restaurants near my home um, and actually going on walks around my neighborhood and collecting the bones. Um, so, and kind of acting like I, I don't, I don't know why I was doing that. I just started doing that and um, almost acting like a cremator. Um, so I brought the bones back to my studio and um, crushed them and basically turned them to ash and then um, mix them with a, with a kind of a binder. And I made these wood panels and kind of carved them to look like stones and, and uh, put the bone, the ash basically on the bone, on the, on the stones to, to make it look like that. So I, there's this sort of alchemy of, or a transformation of material and through process that I'm starting to be interested in not, um, and especially with with this, I know I, I I've gotten questions about that because I do talk about using bones in my um, in the book itself. I have an essay portion where I talk about a, a different work that had bones in it, and I don't at all mean to you know do that lightly, especially because a lot of art material has animal parts and you know is um, has different animal materials in it. So I do I I, I kind of made these as a way to um, kind of honor or um, uh, kind of exhume their bodies in a sense and, and give a different form to them that we're not used to seeing. So um, I know that wasn't exactly the answer to your question, but. Oh, no, not, um, no, no, it was wonderful. It, it was terrific. Um, and I'm gonna ask you a pointed question, which I'm sure you've heard. Art is very human and it's, well, I mean, you know, various biologists mm -hmm. go out and they say, oh, you know, um, gorillas, I think it was gorillas, or, um, are using sticks, twigs, you know, to poke at ant things and da 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 da. Uh, and that there are certain kinds of, um, and my own experience is, which is broader is in terms of aesthetics. Uh, but people might say, well, isn't this sort of reifying? The humanness, in other words, it, you know, doesn't isn't art because it's only appreciated and it's only intended for other humans. Isn't yeah. that um, it, isn't that contrary to what your real what your mission is? Yeah, I actually, if it's okay, I just want to read um, yes, so I, a part of because it, it it I I know that question so well, and I sort of I just want to read this short paragraph. Yeah. This is actually from the um, essay part of yes. the book, but, um, that's why I asked the question. <laughs> okay, good. good. I'll, I'll, I'm going to read it and then respond more, more specifically. But okay. so I write, um, art can seem frivolous when faced with the unending assault on animal lives that has reached exponential proportion. Art will not save these lives or stop these systems, but it will do the quiet, slow subterranean work that is required along with the urgent work of act activism. Art seeks, makes, and shares meaning between us humans. In this way, it can be tasked with conceiving new ways to relate to the others with whom we are fated on this earth. So um, I would say that, you know, even in the realm of like personhood, you know, it's it's not that it's not the that the animals need to change or prove anything to us. It's our own conceptions, our own you know, posture in the world that needs to change. So I think art, though, yes, it's definitely made by a human for human eyes, um, that I see it, I see my work as hoping to, you know, make that, 
However, whatever kind of shift that my own person with my one small life can make, you know, um, that, that shift in, in, in attention and conceiving. And, um, so, because it's not, you know, that the non-humans are, are as they are, they don't, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's us that needs to change. And so that's why I feel art to be important in that. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, I think there are some amazing artworks though out there that are kind of, I mean, which have their own ethical problems of possibly, you know, art that, you know, uh, collaborates with bees or, you know, kind of, uh, art that's embedded in landscapes. Um, so there are different, definitely within, um, art, there are various different approaches that kind of include animals more, which I just, I, I, I just don't personally feel very comfortable with that. I mean, maybe in some, some point, but at this point, I, I think images and I mean, it's very traditional at this point, you know, cont contemporary art has kind of gone off left field in terms of all the different forms art can make, but I, I do, I'm very traditional and I make paintings and drawings, but I, I do think that they still have something to offer. Um, well, I think you, you said it beautifully in your essay, you know, um, and, and I think there's the transformative and the in intention in that way, um, just like any other activity. The other thing is, is I think that um, from you, the way you describe it, how you approach your art um, and, and it, it's more of a being, yeah. <laughs> you know, rather than the doing. I mean, the doing is, is harnessed, but it is rooted in this sort of being. And that being is a kind of a transformative process. Yeah. Um, certainly what you have described in the book and both in our conversation here in that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's like, it's okay to be imperfect too. Like I, I think there's so much, you know, I, I'm always very sensitive about the ethics of what I, what I do, even if it's not involving animals of just like, um, and so like, even with the bone stones, you know, like I can see people asking me questions or, or things that I hadn't thought of, or kind of putting holes into that, what I was thinking about that. But I do think as far as empathy is concerned, like I love, I, I love etymology and, and words. And so for me, a, a word that's in the same, it's a sibling of empathy being attention of this, like etymo etymologically attention, meaning to stretch toward. Mm -hmm. And I just think that kind of, it's, you know, it's like reaching out, it's a stretching toward, it's, it's not that it's, it's an imperfect thing. You know, it's, it's, um, a flexibility, uh, um, an extension of ourselves, but, um, you know, we never reach, you know, it's, it's, it's unreachable in some ways, the distance between us and other, and an, another animal, it's, there's an unbridgeable distance and yet we still can reach out, you know, we can still stretch, stretch toward and in relationship can cultivate, um, an understanding. Mm -hmm. Can you describe, um, your you know, one of the, the first question I asked you really sort of or part I asked you three questions <laughs> so that wasn't really fair but um, one of them was um, do you feel I mean this is where we we start tripping over language right um, but do, do you feel more a part of nature or or less mm. apart from this delineated form we call human yeah. Um, you know, I, when I'm, I mean, it's not an either or question. I know, I know it's like in my, it's hard. I mean, it's in the human spaces. I feel so in the, you know, human spaces. I know that that's still like the human nature dualism is not good to replicate, but at the same time, you know, when I'm in a city or like in my classroom or, you know, like all of that, it's, it's so easy to forget where I even am on this earth, but it's like, you know, just going into the park nearby or, and we all have this sensibility, even if we're not aware of it, but being outside, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, there's this immediate ch change that it's like, you feel integrated and now not in the sense of, you know, I, I have a lot of envy or like sadness over the fact that, you know, you can name any species wolves or um, rhinos or, you know, all these most species are integral in their ecosystems in some way. And I feel like that 
leads to a sense of belonging and being a part mm-hmm. of nature. And the fact that we, now again, that we is problematic, but um, most of our lives are not, our actions aren't benefiting other species in a larger sense beyond, you know, some rodents and such, um, but largely constricting non-human life. So in that sense, I definitely have a hard time feeling apart because I feel like most, you know, just um, contemporary life contributes to that shrinking um, effect. But I think it's so important to feel that in some capacity because that's what brings, keeps us moving forward and, and um, that spiritual entwinement between us and other life um, yeah, it's so joyful. It's such a, um, you know, I, I feel the most (laughs) myself, the most alive, the most connected when I'm, um, you know, I have this park that I go to and I, um, love watching the herons there. And so it's just that like, um, yeah, it's, it's such a wonderful feeling when you have that sense, but it is a, it's a small part of my life. The rest of my life, I, I have a hard time feeling apart. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, so, um, does this also, we, we kind of touched on this before, but in these processes, um, I, I guess I, I'm kind of focusing on this notion of beginning a culture as such or way of being, which really goes beyond identity. Yeah. Um, and, and could you just talk about that in that way? I, I just, I feel like you're the, um, the work that you have created and that are in, that you are engaged in kind of blurs that quite a bit, just even in the examples that you gave, maybe there's other examples you'd like to show us from your book or, or read, but, you know, talking about that kind of dis disidentification into something that's really more ambiguous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Hmm. I mean, I think, you know, just the example of the herons, like I, which actually maybe I'll show you. Um, I, I'm, I make it, I've been making a series of works that are sort of, um, in response to encounters that I have with animals in my daily life, but you know, the normal normative response to seeing a heron is like, people will maybe stop for a second, take an image and move on. You know, it's not, it's not that kind of like, kind of going back to what we are saying about sensory engagement that when we pause and, and watch and, you know, I think vision is normally seen as not the, our strongest suit in terms of sensory, um, the way to, to reach empathy. But I do think vision, if we're, you know, aware of our bodies, you know, like what must that water feel like? Or like when she, you know, like the, the heron stepping in the water, like I, I do have a bodily response to watching um, another animal. So, I mean, let me just say, I think just about vision, it, don't you really mean, um, I mean, I think we're over visual. <clears throat> so the way you're describing it is that like, for example, when you see and when yeah. you watch, you know, you're participating. So your vision is a participatory vision. Yeah. It's yeah. It's not a no. predatory vision. It's a rather, right. you know, a, a participatory one. Right. Yeah. No, I do think their vision is the umbrella, but within that definitely different kinds of vision. And I think when we're more in tune with our bodies, like our senses overlap. So, you know, something we hear is going to relate to, you know, something we're tasting or like, you know, we have this, our whole body is one um, responsive, you know, um, organism. So, for me, maybe, yeah, I think it is something I take for granted or, um, those of us within that is like seeing is, 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 it feels, um, I feel activated, even if it's just, I'm not, uh, there's no touch, but I feel like I could touch, you know, it's that kind of, um, attention from a distance. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll just show you that, uh, brief, um, So actually, yeah, well, um, (laughs) I'll just show a couple. So I have, there was, um, a pond that I would go sit at and I, I, my, I had a sort of a ritual of taking off my shoes, um, which I just kind of came to me naturally. Anyway, that's the, uh, references the title, but, um, these 
this sort of select group of geese and ducks that I would sit with. So I, I made sort of a, they're really small works because I wanted them to feel intimate. Um, but I have a few um, from that so that they're kind of, again, a little bit disappearing or not quite there. Um, and then this is the um, one of, more recently of the crane that I would, or the heron that I would, um, I would sit at night. I always sat by this pond and I, I, the, the title, I would, I only ever knew her as a silhouette, but, um, this, uh, yeah, kind of like what Liz was saying in my introduction, like, I love that ed- enigmatic quality of other animals, this sort of, um, way in which they're like the there and not there-ness that, there's this part of them that's always private, this mystery of being that's never, um, that's never known to us, but that I think is a wonderful thing. Um, so anyway, yeah, those are the few <laughs> that I, from that series, I have more on my website, but. Um. That's beautiful. I'm going to ask you one more question and I'm, I'm doing this for a friend and colleague of mine. Um, and uh, then I, I'll, I'll stop talking because I know that people will, will want to um, converse with you. Uh, she, she's working with um, uh, art making and community, uh, and, and in particular uh, as a I don't even I don't even want to describe it, but art making and community um, as a as a fundamental healing slash I don't even like I said I hate to put words on it, but um, what. What do you, are you, do you have any thoughts on that in terms, I know, you know, you're talking about working in solitude, but this notion of um, creating art together um, in the same kind of participatory way that you're talking about. Yeah, I, I don't have as much experience with that. I did work for a time at a, um, an organization that helped fund um, socially engaged art projects being those that didn't have that kind of like authorship of the, you know, Mm -hmm. artist in their own, you know, in their studio kind of um, that model, um, which I, yeah, I mean, the works, the, the projects that we funded were really wonderful. And I think, um, yeah, like for me, it's one of those things like, I think they're great. It's just something I know I can't do because I'm, that's just not my (laughs) own sensibility, but I do think that um, they have a lot of potential to cultivate that kind of attention that we've been talking about Mm -hmm. that um, through certain practices, through certain, you know, um, exercises can help um, generate that because I, I, I really do think of all, you know, yes, being vegan, yes, all of those things, but like underneath everything, like I really think it's that like curiosity and attention and um, just critical gaze, critical um, critical thinking that we really need to um, come back to. I mean, it's just so clear how absent all of that is from most people's lives. It's so easy to be passive. So that kind of bodily awareness that you're talking about. I think participatory art, art projects and art spaces are really necessary for that. I think they mm-hmm. are, are becoming more and more to mm-hmm. um, socially engaged art is becoming more and more of a, of a field. So. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much. I'll turn it over to Liz and everyone else. <laughs> thank you both. That was wonderful. And I'm, about ready to bust out my finger paints already. So um, we'll try not to linger too long, but um, just a quick plug. um, uh, If you want to join us for our next event, it will be February 6th, which is also a Sunday. Um, With that, uh, if anyone does have any questions, uh, feel free to, you can raise your hand. There's a little digital option for that, or you can just go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, or you can type it in the chat box if you don't feel comfortable asking yourself, and I'll read that out loud for you. Um, It looks like, all right, we got one straight off the bat, Isabella. Hello, I'm I'm always too 
too curious and too fascinated and consequently really irritating. Um, Linnea, I, while you were talking, I had to have a quick look at your at your website and the work is truly beautiful and, um, and the poetry and the essays sound wonderful too. And so I wanted to thank um, the Institute and, and indeed you for enabling me to find your work. Um, and this this is something that's um, that I think um, I think you'd be sympathetic to, and I don't know quite how to think about it myself. Um, I was brought up in a farming community, and I'm very interested in ecology as well as in animals. Like you, I'm I'm a vegan, um, and I met a farmer the other day. And the farms here, we don't have any um, factory farms in the UK. Um, thank goodness chickens don't get such a great deal, but at least sheep and cows have a better time. Um, and they have started to put the sheep in the arable fields over the winter. Um, and this prevents, radically lessens the use of chemical fertilizers and chemical herbicides. And so environmentally, it's a it's a, a sort of really good thing. And you know, then I suddenly start thinking, oh, what? so then what? What do we have? Agriculture that has, you know, none of this um, old farming practices of rotation. And I I suddenly, you know, I was suddenly faced with this. Oh, old agriculture has these integrated properties. And how does that fit into my <laughs> ethical view? Um, but the other thing was that this young farmer, farm worker, it's a large farm, but um, he said, oh, we're all very soft with the sheep. And I had seen them handling the sheep and, it, you know, I'd been watching from a distance. I run around there and I'd seen them handling the sheep and they are really soft with the sheep. And I'd seen how the sheep related to them. And I was standing with him and it was a freezing cold day. And every time his eyes turned to the sheep, his his face just lit up. Now he eats sheep, but he loves sheep in a way that I think, you know, 90% of people, whether they eat meat or not, don't actually have any interaction, any understanding of sheep. And he was saying, oh, they're so clever. And, you know, the how they're always waiting for him. And I just thought there is so much more nuance and integration in this area than I like to think about when I you know, get my avocado with its huge carbon footprint sent over to the UK. How how can I feel good? <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I I I mean I I empathize with that a lot. And I think, you know, it's so it is hard to make any kind of generalized, you know, I said before, like this farm could have happened anywhere, but at the same time, there are, you know, I've had conversations of like, well, the farm you know, that my grandma, you know, has is not like this, you know, they do care for their animals. And so they do love them. And I, I do think though, that that's a little bit still um, telling of how we separate out. It's like, we love them, but then we're still able to kill them and eat them. And so there's, I think there's still dissonance there. That's um, mm -hmm. that, I mean, for me, it's like, I don't, I'm not any kind of um, absolutist in the sense of we should never eat animals. Like, of course, I, I can understand that there are certain instances like the Inuit people or certain, you know, like where it's, it's part of your, your ecosystem to be a predator. But at the same time, like we're in such a, like, it's like, we're in such a critical moment right now with climate, with the climate crisis, with you know, I feel like we have so much reparation to do in terms of the animal, the animal lives that keep being lost and the state of our climate that for me, it's like, I just don't think any violence is, is justifiable. Um, but, at the, you know, it's like, I understand, you know, it's like that sense of, well, they're, you know, making it so that not having to use chemical fertilizers. And it's like, I understand that. And so it's, but then again, I feel like there must be, again, I, I don't know a ton about that, but there must be natural ways to, yeah, like the rotation of crops and um, plant-based ways to keep the soil and the plants healthy without the use of animals, especially like I, I have a hard time with when there's no choice involved, when it's just they're utilized as a tool. Um, 
So, but I, I can see that being tricky. I appreciate your question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have one off the bat? If not, I do. I don't know if it's a question though. It's more of an observation. So um, I've been reflecting on, uh, you know, the idea is art, you know, made by humans for humans. And I kind of don't think it is. I think some is for sure. I think there's definitely, you know, sort of what comes to mind is, you know, the um, art, you know, grandmaster artist alone in his studio with his paints, um, curtains drawn, you know, and then it goes immediately from there into someone's, you know, sort of house and then into like a museum. And so it keeps, you know, it remains enclosed in these spaces that are, intentionally, you know, blocked off to other species. I mean, there's probably even a door, you know, a sign at the door that says no animals allowed except for service animals, right? So that I think is definitely art made by humans for humans. I think sometimes that art gets enjoyed by animals on accident, we might get frustrated. And I think of statues of like, you know, even like the Confederate generals and stuff like that have, that have fortunately been taken down in quite a few places in the country in recent years, but, and all the pigeons that enjoyed those statues and all of the hair pulling, maddening ways of spiky things and things that we've done to try to help them <laughs> avoid appreciating that kind of art um, when they are somehow drawn to that, you know, in terms of texture, in terms of color, when they could choose anywhere to land, you know, in a right. city. So, um, and with that said, I think about, um, you know, animal artists, I think about whale songs, bird songs, if anyone knows me, they know I love bowerbirds, which are those um, amazingly cheeky Australian uh, bird, um, this whole family of bird species. They're amazing. If you've never Googled bowerbirds, please do, but not right this second, in like <laughs> 10 minutes <laughs> um, after you buy kindling. Um, and uh, uh, they have, you know, these dances that they do and they have this architectural design and, and we appreciate it mm. because I think there is some sort of substratus thing that's not species specific. I think it's, I, I don't know where along the evolutionary tree, you know, whether we were all primordial fish and had some sort of, you know, aesthetic, you know, appreciation or, you know, where it is exactly. But I do know that I have definitely seen it um, emanating from and appreciating it from other species, as well as, you know, if I'm making a song, all my parrot friends, they'll sing along and they'll even improvise, you know, with their own, you know, for better or worse, you know, singing, <laughs> yelling. So, yeah, I don't know. I kind of disagree. I kind of think that art is this deeper, hmm. um, not species bound, you know, I think it's this deeper substratum that, in, in, and we are engaged in it, that we're actually somehow deepening into that in sensorial engagement as you observed is is a huge part of it and intuitiveness is a huge part of it you know when is my nest finished if I'm a bird and like perfect how I want it um versus when is you know a, a painting or a, a rock or whatever um finished as an art piece you know so I don't yeah. know I, I kind of think yeah I think it's multi-species yeah oh I think I mean I I definitely you know, I don't know a lot about that field, but I do, I've listened to several podcasts or other, you know, acoustic biologists or musicians or, you know, all these ways in which people are observing. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the, that other animals have a sensibility of aesthetics or what's beautiful. Like I, I do, I definitely don't agree with any kind of sentiment, sentiment that humans are the sole owners of beauty, you know, of, of appreciation of beauty. So um, no, I think that's a great point, Liz. I, 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 I definitely see that. And I, I, I'm, I'm was trying to remember, I don't remember the woman whose essay this is referring to, but a woman who sort of lived for a time with a group of baboons, I believe I, I might be getting that wrong. It was a while ago, but one thing I remembered about the essay is she talks about having this, um, being with this troop of baboons and, um, them stopping for a while um, at this waterfall and just like sitting in silence and um, at this waterfall. And like, you can't, like, of course, we're not sure what was going on within their bodies or within their minds, but like an appreciation of what that must feel like the, the bodily engagement of 
the beauty of a waterfall. I mean, the other species, I, I, I don't doubt that, that they were in awe. <laughs> so, um, and even something as simple as, you know, one of the dogs in my family eats exactly half of her food before she takes mm-hmm. a water break and she comes back and eat, but she divides the bowl perfectly oh, wow. in half so every, yeah. every day. It's very interesting. Yeah. 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 She definitely has an idea ahead of time of how much and what she wants it to look like. And you know, it's, it's uncanny really. So yeah, even in those small moments like that, um, definitely. definitely. it looks like Isabella said that could be Barbara Smuts who you were referring oh, to. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. That is Barbara Smuts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Isabella. Barbara Smuts is, um, is, uh, still writing quite a bit actually. So she's, yeah, she's great. Oh, I, 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 I remember that essay was like early on in my sort of, cause I, I was lucky enough to go to a school that had some animal ethics, um, animal studies classes. So I remember being very moved by that specific essay. Um, Looks like um, she just said Carl Safina on macaws and beauty is really mm. great too. Yes, yeah. I agree. And there is that very famous clip. I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it's, I think, a Kia, uh, which is an endangered parrot, and he gets shagged by a very rare parrot. It's a hilarious. It's oh hilarious. My gosh. <laughs> uh, I highly recommend that one. Maybe I can find it if other people have questions. Maybe I can find it while you're talking. I guess I'm, I'm, well, I'm reminded of, of, you know, I mean, I guess we're in the kind of this, like, you know, questioning, why are we doing what we're doing kind of mode. And, and I, I love Alice in Wonderland. And there's this one passage where um, there's a, I guess it's the mouse who's talking about history because they got wet because they fell in Alice's pool of tears. And, and so he, the mouse is going on history is the driest thing I know. And he starts pontificating and he said, you know, the Earl of, um, I think I've forgotten what it was, the Earl of Northumbria or something like that, found it advisable. And so the duck says, found what? He said, when I find something, it's a frog or a worm. Um, I, I just think that Alice in Wonderland has a lot of very important philosophy. Yeah. And I, I guess that's what I was I was actually seeing is, is that when we look at this notion of we're not a part, we're just, everyone is one mush, you know, with this sort of diversification of form. Um you know, we're looking at it from the perspective of quote unquote, other animals and nature and birds and insects and rocks and things like that, then it it really comes down to the intention and, um, and the impact of a particular act, which is, you know, the ethos. And so in in the sense of, um, you know, from that perspective, you know, not to make everything sort of it's not utilitarian, but to, to understand everything that we do, including art, as not art, but as um, ways of um, revitalizing, invigorating, fortifying uh, wholeness. I mean, these words sound sort of cliche-like, but really this, this notion of wholeness and the desire to, to, to connect and communicate in, in some fashion. Um, I mean, that's what I see, you know, it's just sort of like um, with the animals and, and the trees that I see. I, in fact, I was just talking to someone yesterday about the trees, um, that uh, they have a lot of intention. Um, and uh, we, there's a man that, that I, I know he does, he's an arborist as such, and he's really extraordinary. And, um, you know, he, he comes over here because <laughs> we have one tree that is very large, very old um, maple. And every once in a while, we ask him if he would come over and other trees too, because we don't, we're making the decision of not getting squished. So he'll come over and he says, well, if we take this branch here, you know, cause we're trying to keep the, the, the tree is decaying, but you know, we're trying to retain the agency of the tree as much as possible. And he, he talks about how, when he does his arborist work, he said, I, I always really listen to what the tree is saying. I mean, he's not a woo woo saying it like that. He's saying it in very practical terms. Um, He said, I really listen because if I don't listen to that tree, something will happen. So if there's a branch that I think, well, this will be a good branch to do. Like when he went up here, you know, he said, okay, this is what I think would be helpful because then that will balance the tree. And he said, but I won't know until I'm up there and start working with the tree. Right. And he says, uh, 
it always, if it's not what the tree thinks is right, the tree will, something will happen, you know, his saw will break or, you know, whatever in that way. So I guess I'm just talking about like going back to the duck, <laughs> you know, found it advisable. I love that, that particular thing, because it's this very abstract, you know, found out it was advisable off in this sort of la la land. And then the duck is saying found what, you know, the whole point is, is why would I listen to you if you're not really talking to me in a meaningful kind of way? And, and I see that about art, you know, taking art from its capital A, you know, stance to just really embedding it, um, which I, I believe you have sort of embedding it into um, the substrate of life. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it, it has, it does have the capacity to slow us down and to, I mean, I think that that's what I hope and I think can be really special about certain art. Um, of course, there are so many different kinds of art that don't do this, but like bring us down to the essence of what we care about. And, and, and um, yeah, so I, I, um, I love that you said that about the trees too. I, I, I think that's, um, yeah, such a fault of ours that we don't, I, I mean, like, you know, a lot of like making art, like voice for the voiceless or speaking for the animals. Like I really don't, I really stay away from those terms. Cause there's, there's so, you know, clearly community, not, not in a way that we necessarily understand, but they're very communicative of who they are and what they want. And um, so I think that's so great. That it's very, um, I feel like unique for an arborist to have that point of view because I know that probably many of them don't. But I mean, we're finding out more and more how every, I mean, I think that's integral to all beings, that kind of intentionality and meaning making and purpose. I think that's not at all a human uh, unique quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, are there anything, is there anything else you'd like to add, um, Linnea, in terms of, you know, your work that is unfolding now or, or show us um, anything that you wanted to before we close? I'm stepping on Liz's yeah. lines. Um, yeah, well, I you can look, see more of my work on my website. I, I've um, sort of continued or I, I'm having a show coming up um, in, a, in a week um, and I, I have work from, I've been also doing this project at a zoo near my home. Um, I've been going, going every weekend for the past, uh, year and a half and have made work from that experience. So I have that on my website as well. Um, and yeah, I, I, um, sort of, you know, continue to see which, see the, the ways in which I can um, add to this conversation. So it's kind of like for, for probably many of us here, it's like, it's your life's work. You know, it's like, I'll keep doing this until, you know, there's no reason to, which I don't see that happening anytime soon, but it's, I think it's, you know, it's one of those things that it's like, of course, this is the very difficult, heartbreaking work, but at the same time, it uh, le le lands us to the most important parts of living, you know, and being on this earth. So there's kind of a dual, um, joy and pain <laughs> involved in this kind of work. So, um, anyway, well, thank, thank you so you. much. <laughs> lovely for... getting to know you and, and your artwork is beautiful. And I think I can speak for everyone here when I say we're all very much looking forward to seeing what you come up with next and, and in years into the future. So thank yeah. you so much for being here. Um, and thank you everyone else as well. I know time is precious. So we really do appreciate you taking time out of your weekend to be with us. Yeah. Thank so. you, Gay, and all of you um, for, for coming. So yeah. That was and if you'd like to share this recording with anybody, it'll be on our website, www.crulos.org. So if you know people who you think would benefit from this conversation, who would be interested in Linnea's art, uh, please do share because it really does make a big difference. Okay. And thanks, everyone. Kindling is available. <laughs> it is. I already have it in my cart right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.